All right, my girl. I'm gonna go out for a little bit. I'll be back. Yes, Kiyo. I'll be back. No, we're not going to the river today. It's too wet. It's too wet. Okay. Eat all It's a good day. It is closing in on 11 o'clock in the morning on a wet Tuesday, the 18th of June, 2024, in the lunar cycle Misamsota, the long rains. <laughs> this is our monsoon season, wouldn't you know? crazy this morning or overnight blood reserve got snow over standoff area a little bit closer to the mountains than we are here in Lethbridge yeah they got snow snow in June it happens <laughs> and another crazy thing right here on the west side of Lethbridge about four blocks from here and where we're gonna go on our walk um, as I'm talking on the video today there's been for the past couple of nights well not last night but the night before that and the night before that um, a mountain lion visiting the neighborhood so since it's been all wet and stuff I thought why not go out today and look around for some mountain lion paw prints in the neighborhood how cool would it be if I could find a good muddy paw print you know or a set of them going right through the neighborhood that I show that that would be cool so we're gonna go look I don't I don't think I'm gonna find anything but uh, if you don't look you don't find and I've got other errands to do I've got a couple of supplies and stuff to pick up at the stores out this way and I figured today would be a good day to get back to the memoirs and do boyhood Memoirs number three, which I think might be the last of the the boyhood memoirs prior to my 12 year old or 12th year synthesis. That'll be another video and then and then we'll have uh, Ryan the martial arts and Ryan the military and proceed from there. Um, we'll get to Ryan in high school later. <laughs> But uh, yeah, today will be boyhood memories number three. And you know, last time I talked a lot about media influences on me. Uh, media influences, particularly those kind of compelling me toward the military as a career and identity option, you know? Um, but, and that was, you know, because in reality, the media has played a big role. The, the media and marketing has played a big role in shaping me and it does in, in shaping all of us, I think. But I'm, I was, you know, I was a little different, I think, than other kids. I've seen it happen. Uh, I've seen other kids that were like me that like role play basically, um, you know, when I wanted to be Popeye, I had to be like, I had to have a fucking hammock to sleep in and a sailor hat to wear and a crew cut, you know? When I wanted to be Magnum P.I., I had to have those shirts and, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, look into be, what, what being a detective is and all this stuff. And, um, you know, each of the, each of the kind of like movie characters that, that really influenced me that I kind of um, emulated them and stuff. I see that happening with other kids um, sometimes to the extent that like I, I took it but uh, but I'm, I'm not saying that's everybody's experience in any case the media wasn't my only influence on boyhood and stuff so today we're gonna talk about some other things starting with Stevie Lannan which I, I mentioned before but didn't get back to 
Stevie was a kid that I met. I must have met him. I think I like really started getting friends with him in about third grade-ish. You know, I think we were in the same third grade. And he lived about a block away from me. Um, and he lived on the same street as Stacy Epping, who was my girlfriend, first grade, second grade. Um, and Stevie was kind of a, like, he had an older sister, an older brother, and a younger brother. And two, you know, fairly alcoholic parents. <laughs> and it was a bit of a rowdy group. They had a, they had a pet goose in their backyard called Anker. And uh, their backyard was really uh, built up lots of trees and stuff and a pond. And they lived on the edge of what we call the Black Path, which was this concrete pathway just like this. Um, except it went down a steep hill behind some houses like this. And imagine, you know, you got a row of houses like this and a fence line and a Black Path going down a steep hill. But on this side, it's just old growth forest. It's not university drive as it is here <laughs> old growth forest um but along your edge thick blackberry patches right thick blackberry patches so we would play on the black path quite a bit and um you know i got i got to be friends with stevie i think through school and just proximity <laughs> but then you know, he bought a snake like I had. A, I had Chachi, my my boa constrictor, and then he bought a reticulated python and a corn snake. I talked about that in my Ryan and the and the snakes video, and um, we got to be really close friends through those snakes, and um, and then playing lots together. You know, we played lots together. We played on the black path. Uh, we built go-karts or rather you know our dads and, and shit built us helped us build go mostly built us go-karts <laughs> uh, not not motorized ones just like riddle little rascal style go-karts to, to go down the black path on and at one point Steve's dad uh, he he rode motorcycle and he got in a bad accident and um, he was he was laid up for a bit it was it was pretty bad but his helmet from the accident uh, we commandeered that helmet started using it as you know to take our go-karts to you know put on our heads as we took our go-karts down the hill on the black path and the, and the helmet was still like really at that time it still had blood in it from the accident <laughs> so everybody who would wear it would come off with little blood splotches on the side of their face and stuff from the cushioning and uh we'd we'd roll down the black path and you know you get going so fast either you're gonna either you're gonna like die at the end or you're gonna crash into the blackberry bushes at some point and it, you know, either way, like at the very end, there's a creek. <laughs> there's blackberries and then a creek. Um, so if you really, if you really plow all the way down and through, you're probably gonna smash through the blackberries and end up in the creek. And the creek had uh, nutria in it that are kind of like um, giant water rats. Eh? We called them river rats, nutria. And uh, I had, when I was a little kid, I didn't tell this story, but uh, my my family went. I think some of my some of my uh, mom's family and stuff, along with my family, we went to some kind of um, state camp area in California. And crossing a river with my bare feet, I stepped on a uh, on a broken glass bottle, and and just cut my foot really bad. And as a kid, I had, you know, you could see that scar. It was very evident on the bottom of my foot. And I made up a big story to my friends <laughs> about how I'd been, you know, attacked by a river rat. <laughs> and so uh, everybody feared the river rat. 
you know, the nutria, even though there's absolutely nothing to fear. But it was kind of a scary animal. Like, I mean, we'd be we'd be in the creek sometimes, and the nutria come fucking hauling past us. They didn't have any uh, any fear, it seemed. Anyway, we played a lot on the Black Path. Um, we played a lot of a game called Smear the Queer, which was, it was like football. <laughs> in fact, we even would wear our, like, football padding. I remember Stevie and his brother and stuff, they went down to Anderson Sporting Goods, and uh, every year there was, like, Anderson Sporting Goods would get some of the NFL, uh, you know, stuff that was being annexed. You know, NFL would get new gear and and put those out through the different sporting goods chains in the past. And so uh, Stevie and his brothers and shit, they'd always have actual like NFL, uh, you know, helmets and stuff like this. But we had to buy pads that fit our little boy bodies and stuff. But we did, we had like football pads and all of this. And we would go play Smear the Queer. And we get a whole big group of kids to play this. And, he, and what it is, is you find, you know, you just get a big field, like a football field kind of thing. And you take the ball and you throw it up. And whoever gets it is the queer. <laughs> and everybody else runs the tackling. It's, it's the queer against everybody is what it is. And, um, but, you know, like for whatever reason you wanted to be the queer because if you if you never if you never like grabbed the ball and tried to like out dodge everybody um what do you even do in playing the game like the whole game is to is to do that so you try to get the ball you know you try to get that position and uh and see how long you can outlast everybody you know ne you never are gonna outlast everybody they're gonna kill you <laughs> they're gonna squash you um but that was part of the fun. Uh, getting bad tackles was a lot of part of the fun. I remember me and Stevie, we would we would go into school in the morning sometimes. It rained in Oregon so much, uh, and the fields would just be mud and puddles and shit. And we go in there, and our pants would be drenched, our knees would be ripped open and shit. My mom, because she did all the, our sewing and stuff, she would patch like all of my pants had patches knee patches and they never lasted those those I don't know how patches are these days but when I was growing up those ones you buy at the fabric store and patch your stuff denim patches they they were just like their uh, their stickiness their adherence stuff would wear off pretty damn quick and uh, so I'd end up with with the ripped knee plus the patch hanging off of the pants you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we had a lot of fun playing those kind of games and stuff. Um, not sure if it's around the same time, but it might be. Might be. I can't remember when Rocky Three came out, but it, you know, talking about Smear the Queer reminds me of that that point with Rocky Three, and maybe I'll talk about that more with the martial arts video. But yeah, there was a point where my dad bought us boxing gloves. And I know Stevie and them participated in this, but there was a lot of other participation too. At the, by that time, I had other friends and stuff. There was a bunch of kids, but we would have boxing matches in my front yard, like like throwdowns. <laughs> um, with the boxing gloves, and uh, you know, we just take turns being like it was Fight Club, basically, in my front yard. Uh, with my dad supporting it. He bought us mouth guards. Those old, like, white ones that, you know, just fit everybody's mouth. So we just shared the mouth guards. We had mouth guards and, and Sugar Ray Leonard boxing gloves. You know, Sugar Ray Leonard, Leonard Everlast boxing gloves or something like that. And, uh, and we just had fights in the front yard with the boys. <laughs> So I had a lot of fun with Stevie Lannon and them. I remember one time being really humiliated though, and, and it kind of put a grip, a, a, a split a little bit. Like that's what me and Stevie's relationship start breaking up. I got another story that kind of precedes that that I'm gonna tell, but um, in a minute. I'm about to go into a store over here and then I'll 
get into that story, but I'll tell this one first, which comes after, and it is kind of a lead-in into me and Stevie going our separate ways. But um, we were over at Stacy Eppin's house. Stacy Eppin's dad had built them a, like a big toy kind of thing in the backyard, and we played in it. We used to play Shark, um, a game where you had to be on the big. The big toy was like a ship. You know, and if you're off of the, if you're on the ground, that's the ocean. And so we would have a shark, and of course the shark can't leave the ocean. It's always on the ground. But everybody on the ship, you know, would tease that, you know, it's like a game of tag, but the, the, the person who's it is limited. They have to stay on the ground. And they try to catch people as they like mess around and stuff. So one time we were playing that, and I remember I was shark. And I was trying to sneak around the bottom of the big toy. And then I felt this, you know, like I <laughs> was getting water on my head. And I looked up and Stevie's little brother, Jimmy, was pissing on my head. <laughs> He's just standing up on the top, pissing on me. Oh, geez. I, I was going to fucking kill the kid. And me and Stevie came, you know, because Stevie was going to protect him. Me and him both had little brothers. And uh, we're going to talk about that, too. I got in a lot of fights because of my little brother. But uh, we, both, we both were always defending our little brothers. And that time, I was going to kill Stevie's little brother, Ben. <clears throat> and, uh, but Stevie, Stevie stepped in to fight for him. And me and him didn't fight, but we came close. And, it, and, that, and from that point, I know there was a kind of a rift because they never apologized for pissing on my head. <laughs> I mean, it's just the, the crazy shit boys do and everything. But that was, that, was a, that was a disrespect that couldn't go unpassed, you know? So, yeah, I never did get beyond that. But uh, anyway, yeah, I'm going to go over here to the savers and uh, I'll get back on in a minute. All right. So, speaking of having to defend our little brothers, there was this kid who lived, you know, like I described my house and we had a, a one acre or a half acre or something uh, behind, I think it's a half acre behind the house where we garden. So, behind my, the strip of houses on my street, everybody had that half acre and then there was the next row of houses so in that next row of houses along that street maybe four houses down from ours or something there was this kid that lived there named Vasco and I don't know what was wrong with Vasco there's something wrong with him you know he wasn't normal he wasn't like retarded but he's like something's up you know Something's up, he's a weirdo. And, uh, but he'd get violent, hey? Eh? And one time he came after uh, my little brother with a pitchfork. And I ended up going to fight him and take the pitchfork away from him. I don't know how I did that, but <laughs> I did. I took it away from him and I chucked it on top of his house. And then his mom got really um, upset, you know. That, uh, that the pitchfork was up on the house and I was like what the fuck he was trying to stab me with it you know he was he was he was like you know stabbing and um, uh, there was there was a couple of occasions when I fought him over stuff when he was trying to fight with my brother and Stevie the same thing so one day <coughs> me and Steve we were at his place. His parents had gone for the day, and uh, and I don't. It was just us. I don't remember even his brother. No, nobody else being around. It's just us, and we were at his place, and he had a big Douglas fir. A few of them in the backyard, but one that was particularly tall. And we decided we were going to go climb that Douglas fir. Uh, where you could see out through the whole neighborhood and we did that we climbed way way up there you know um, and 
you know, we could see all over the place, hey? There was a place down below the Black Path, across the creek, there was a neighborhood down there where the rich kids lived. Uh, we could see down, we could see their street from there. We could see a few blocks around us. And we seen Vasco. We seen Vasco about a block away and, and also a block or two away from his house. So we, he wasn't guarded, he couldn't run home to mommy. And so we were like, let's get down from here. Let's go kick Vasco's ass. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just how it was. So, um, off we went to get down the tree as fast as we could and go kick Vasco's ass. And as we're climbing down the tree, I must have heard a crack because I closed my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, Stevie wasn't there. And, uh, you know, I looked around. He wasn't there and I couldn't, I couldn't like, the, we were so high up in, in the Douglas fir, in a big, big Douglas fir. I couldn't see all the way down to the bottom. The branches were blocking it too much. And so, um, and so I just started climbing down, uh, assuming that uh, my friend had fallen from the tree, and indeed he had. He had fallen all the way from the top of a very high Douglas fir, and I'm sure whacked a whole lot of branches on the way down, you know, like Rambo First Blood is like that kind of tree, and like that kind of height, you know, like when Rambo jumps off the cliff in First Blood and goes smashing through the, the tree, that's what it was, hey? And uh, sure enough, down on the concrete of the black path at the base of the tree lay Stevie <laughs> face down on the concrete and I went and uh, he was knocked out took me you know I was kind of shaking him and stuff trying to wake him up and stuff and uh, I couldn't wake him up right away and then when I did he just started crying and like I didn't know what to do, hey? So I ran in his house and I called my dad and my dad got the, you know, uh, ambulance over there right away. And uh, the, the paramedics and shit were working on him and um, he didn't remember anything, hey? Like, he didn't know where he was, where his parents were, what was going on, how he got hurt, you know. And uh, funny thing about Stevie was, like, he had this practice. In, it made him, like, a character in school, got him a lot of attention. He had this thing where he used to, like, to smash his head on the desk. Like, we used to hurt ourselves at school. Like, we'd do things on purpose. One of the things we did, I remember, was we used to take our knuckles like this and we'd grab our skin of our nose and pinch and pull it and just do that for like a couple of hours and you'd end up with a like an almost black bruise going straight down your nose. <laughs> a blood blister from, <laughs> from pinching yourself. And uh, Stevie's thing was his, he, he, his head, he claimed, you know, he could smash his head against anything that wouldn't hurt. And so he used to smash his head against desks and stuff like that, you know, just bang. And, uh, and you know, he always seemed okay. Well, maybe that practice helped him out, you know, in the long run, because, uh, he definitely smashed his head on the black path, falling out of a tree and somehow survived this. And it, you know, he was hospitalized and then his parents came home and took him home and he had a, a, an amnesia for a couple of days, eh? <coughs> he wasn't, <laughs> he, 
not like it didn't hurt his head. <laughs> it's probably permanent brain damage. Um, but then, you know, like I said, me and Stevie started drifting apart. Part of that was just like different spirits, you know, and I didn't like the, you know, what happened when we were playing at Stacy's, of course. And then, <laughs> and then another part was the, the school recognized that we were such good friends that they were not going to, like, we weren't going to end up in the fourth grade together either way. We didn't end up in the fourth grade together for another reason, I think, but we wouldn't have ended up either way. Um, they were, it was, it was time to separate us because <laughs> that's what the culture of disjunction does doesn't like to have good strong relationships grow you have to learn to uh, to uh, let go move on and so as we were going into you know we moved into the fourth grade me and Stevie were in different classes um, he went into where was it uh, that wasn't until sixth grade never mind I don't know which fourth grade class he went into but I went into one that was very memorable because at this time let's see fourth grade so I would have been like 10 years old so this is 1982 ish 82 and um, the you know 10 years post Vietnam and there's a lot of refugees um, Vietnamese refugees in Oregon and and all you know Southeast Asian refugees in general Laotian Cambodian refugees and all of this and um, so at our school there were students who were refugees from Southeast Asia and rather than like put them in with all of the other uh, students <clears throat> for whatever reason they decided to give them their own class hey and they merged the grades together um, I think grade one two three I don't even remember seeing grades one two three but four five six were all merged together hey in in one trailer outside of the school and um, so, my dad told them um, that he wanted me in that classroom. You know, he, he wanted me in the trailer for my fourth grade year with the, with the Vietnamese and Cambodian and, and Laotian students. And so, um, I got a really different fourth grade experience <laughs> I was in uh, I was in real like different cultural immersion you know and I still remember even how to speak Vietnamese or some of it like especially how to count you know like I can count in Vietnamese, and the reason for that is because there's a pretty Vietnamese girl who taught me how to count in that class. <laughs> also, she taught me how to draw flowers the way that those girls were drawing flowers. So I still remember how to draw flowers the way that the Vietnamese girls taught me. The boys, they taught me other stuff. They taught me hustle, you know. Uh, we used to make we used to draw tattoos, and that's part of where I'd, we'd use these Crayola pens on just regular, like, lined school paper. But the Crayola pens on the lined paper, uh, you could, you could, you know, cut, cut out your, your drawing and put it on your skin and wet the paper, and the Crayola pen stuff would stick to the skin. Um, so you could, you could make tattoos like temporary tattoos so we used to be drawing tattoos selling those to the white kids <laughs> at recess as well as making stuff out of um, pop cans 
and especially I remember we made the police are like really I just seen like three different police vehicles moving around here there's some shit going on um I'm headed back this way because I actually I got a pee so I'm gonna route back to my house take a whiz and then come back out this way the, the, the mountain lion was seen just out this way okay maybe two blocks over here so we'll come back over but I gotta pee yeah the police are all over this place I don't know what's going on Just calling people in calling people in telling them to get in the building something's going on yeah something's going on interesting yeah all this all the school kids have just been brought in by the police curious Well, a good time for me to go back over there and pee. I don't want to run into any active shooter out here or <laughs> some crazy ass stuff. <laughs> Maybe I'll just go into Safeways and pee. Um, yeah, I think I'll just do that. It's closer. So, where was I? Oh, yeah. We'd make stuff out of the pop cans. And I remember especially we'd make these little... These little whistles I still can make those whistles out of pop cans and stuff but yeah the tattoos the whistles and stuff we'd sell for a nickel a dime a piece to the white kids at recess and uh, we'd hustle we'd make money and shit um, around that time I had I, I had I was playing around with a friendship with a new friendship with a kid named Mike white I think his last name was no Rice. That's his name. Mike Rice. So I was playing around with a, a friendship with this kid and he was one of the rich kids. Like he hung out on the rich kid street. He didn't live there. He lived kind of over by the middle school. But um, yeah, he was one of the kids like the cool kids, you know. And uh, he had the, one of the best bikes and all that kind of shit. We had all our BMX bikes in that time, right? with the pads and all that <laughs> and uh <coughs> i forget what kind he, he had like a red line or some fucking cool ass bike you know that your parents only buy you if you're one of the rich kids and so anyway i was messing around with him i went over to his house one day and his brother was on the high school football team and his brother was like walking around in his football jersey but like nothing else so you'd catch glimpses of his, uh, you know, of his junk hanging out <laughs> below the football jersey and stuff. And I don't know, at the time, like I was 10 years old, boy, and curious and stuff. I was kind of check checking him out a little bit, his older brother. And the way I grew up, it was like, I grew up uh, without any kind of... Um, like negativity put on put toward sexuality in fact if anything I was like encouraged I remember when I was like six or seven years old or something like that my dad giving me a few tips <laughs> he'd asked me something about like whether I'd had a stinky finger or something yet and I didn't know what the heck he was talking about and so he he told me and I immediately uh got to experimenting with that with my next door neighbor Christina and my girlfriend Stacy and all that stuff. Um, I was I was kind of encouraged, and my parents were like like that. Like they didn't um, like they they were nude around us quite a bit. They didn't have any like weirdness about that. They were they were bathrobe parents with nothing else on beneath the bathrobe, and you know how that goes. Like you see that stuff all the time. So. 
like I was I never had any kind of negative associations with sexuality or anything and as a kid I experimented a lot you know with other kids and stuff and with Mike Grace's brother I was checking him out that day and he was like you know you want to you want to see kind of and I'd played that like you know you show me yours I show you mine thing so so many times so um, yeah so we, we went he wanted to go in his bedroom and show me so we went went in there next thing I know I'm I'm locked in a bedroom with him and uh, you know and on my stomach and he's like not letting me out hey and uh, you know I'm starting to cry Mike's starting to freak out at the door you know he knows what's going on but I was locked in there for a time uh, getting like sexually abused <laughs> and that's just what happened and this happened to me at 10 years old but it definitely like I when I got out of there when he finally let me out that I was out of the house and I was fucking never go back there again like <clears throat> and um and you know I was obviously I was traumatized or whatever like it didn't it wasn't what I was expecting I never had a bad experience experimenting with sexuality stuff or anything and um so I, I think I started taking it out like I start like whatever happened you know whatever emotionally went on with me one of my responses was I started shoplifting I started stealing from first from the 7-eleven you know I'd visit like the 7-eleven a lot which was miles from my house like this is a thing hey too this is 10 years old but i am walking and riding my bike miles from my house <laughs> and this was totally normal um i'm gonna finish telling the story before i go in here and, and pee at the safeways um yeah it was totally normal to for me to be gone miles so i'd go over to the 7-eleven which is probably three miles from the house or at least a couple yeah probably three miles um, and I'd steal from them and then I start hanging out with this kid from my class Hip Vu a Vietnamese kid and he lived out by Bimart and I was teaching Hip how to shoplift and basically like we had these jackets and we holes in the liners in the jackets so we could put stuff in the jackets eh? and we go to buy mart and we put a bunch of toys and candy and shit in our jackets and then we go through the the till and we just buy something small or whatever and we got away with it a couple of days and then <laughs> I think we were on our th third or fourth outing and one time we got caught by his brother like we came home and we had all this shit we were messing we were playing with all this candy and toys and stuff and he's like where'd you get all this stuff and uh we were like i don't know you know he's like you're stealing you know he knew he he caught us but and uh but still we kept we did it again <clears throat> and then <laughs> and our third or fourth time or whatever we kind of noticed this guy was following us and then he was behind us at the till and then he met us outside and it was a it was a loss prevention guy uh store detective and he took us in we were busted for shoplifting at bymart and uh called our parents um my dad came and i remember my dad was so pissed off and it was a big pile of stuff that the, that the loss prevention guy had that, you know, he had pulled from our jackets and stuff. My dad was so, like, just the look he was giving me the whole time, I knew I was in some big trouble. And then Hip's mom showed up and she was freak, freaking out. And of course, you know, it's a refugee family. She doesn't want her kids getting in legal trouble and shit. And, so it was a bad scene. I, after that, Hip and I were not allowed to play together again, which is kind of bullshit, but that's what happened. And then uh, I got the worst, like, beaten of my life from my parents. Like, my parents always hit us, you know, but they didn't, like, beat the shit out of us or anything. 
they just like you just like I'd get hit by my mom with a wooden spoon sometimes or you know my dad would use his belt and, but that day from from getting busted stealing shoplifting he beat me up pretty good that day he like used his belt but he held on to my wrist and he kept hitting me until I was you know fight or flight and trying to get away I couldn't get away so I was running circles around him as he's fucking hitting me and it, it hurt you know and it hurt him too I think he cried you know afterward from uh because he didn't want to do that to me but he did you know he did he wanted he wanted to leave an impression that I don't shoplift but it didn't fucking work right it um in honesty like the very next couple of like I couldn't get out of the house I was grounded but as soon as I could at all I remember going to a garage sale about a block away and it was at the home of a police officer and he had like these bandages that had like scooby-doo and stuff like that you know and uh uh boxes of bandages and I I he wasn't nobody was in the garage when I visited and so I just took some of those and was walking away with them and then he came out and, and stopped me and uh, I tried to pretend like oh I thought I left money yeah you know? <laughs> he's like you didn't leave money you're trying to steal those so what if I call your parents and I I was like oh shit you know I'm gonna be in big trouble but yeah I, I didn't stop stealing from from uh, that punishment it didn't make me stop stealing I kept I kept stealing um, but I didn't I didn't steal at that kind of the way that I did at buy mart and stuff with hip anymore I stopped doing that but I still like I still stole mostly I, I burglarize like from cars as I got into my teens and stuff cars and boats and trailers and stuff like that um, yeah I don't know but yeah that's that happened to me and that's one of the darker parts of my boyhood I'm gonna get there's other dark parts I'm gonna talk about some of that when I come out of Safeway I am relieved <laughs> gonna head back into the neighborhood see if we run into the police problem and or evidence of cougars um, and finish my stories here which I don't know that I got too much left to talk about in this one but there is my Aunt Mel <laughs> so I told I said before in my previous memoirs that you know I think my parents were motivated to move us to Oregon as a means of getting us away from the, you know, the Southern California environment, as well as, you know, um, mm. their families that were participating in some of the culture of, the, of Southern California that they didn't appreciate, like, you know, especially like the heavy drugs and alcohol, hey? Um, I, I, I've said both of my grandparents were really big alcoholics both of my grandfathers a lot of my aunts and uncles as well and uh and start getting into drugs and cocaine into the picture and stuff and my parents were just out of there but um didn't take long <laughs> before some of the family started following them you know and there was i don't remember what year it was exactly but it was right around that time the 1982 ish time 80 to 82 ish maybe i don't know but uh my aunt melissa my mom's sister younger sister who everybody th considered to be really beautiful um she was drinking and drugging heavily hey and uh she got in a car accident <clears throat> and broke her neck and I remember us driving down it was like a two-day drive or so somewhere to get to where she was that she was in, in the hospital and and uh, with her broken neck and she had uh, 
you know, the big brace on and pins in her head and all that kind of stuff, eh? Um, oh, there's a mountain cottontail. Yeah, she broke her neck. And then, I, th I don't know exactly what happened, but I think what it is is that... Um, I think what it is is that she was coming to, to stay with us as a, um, as kind of a rehab for her, you know? My parents, I think when we drove down, when she was in the accident, we came back up with a, uh, with a pop-up trailer. And Melissa was gonna come live with us and she was going to be staying in, in our garage in the pop-up trailer. <laughs> I think is, is uh, what was going on. So, you know, after she did some of her healing, like, she didn't come straight away after the hospital, but not too long after, um, she came to stay with us. And she wasn't supposed to, there wasn't supposed to be any alcohol or drugs. Okay, I think that was part of the deal. Oh, let them leave me a message. Yeah, I think that was part of the deal. There wasn't supposed to be any alcohol or drugs or anything around us. And, and then I remember one night, my mom found a bottle of vodka hidden in the, you know, in the toilet uh, tank. Hey, and a big fight ensued. Um, I remember my mom grabbing a, a butcher knife from the kitchen and chasing Melissa into the garage and she yelled at she like she was going to try to stab her with the butcher knife. And my dad had to like hold my mom back and, and get the knife, wrestle the knife from her. <laughs> high, high craziness that night. I mean, this didn't go on every day, but you know, just some of the shit that that it made memories. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, I think after that, Melissa was encouraged to get her own place, and she did, and she ended up living near, you know, in Salem. Um, near us for the rest of her life um, but she died very early like she died pretty early not very early like she abused herself for the rest of her life but um, she died she must have I don't know maybe been 10 years ago or so maybe even a little longer than that uh, alcohol poisoning and just <clears throat> they didn't find her in her apartment until the decomp trip people off my mom had to go clean her up clean that you know I mean they of course the, the <coughs> authorities took the body but when you when you die like that and you just like the blood goes comes out of you and stuff my mom had to basically go clean up all the decomp and take care of Melissa's affairs and all of that crazy stuff and, uh, but there was a lot of, you know, all through my life, growing up from that point, you know, there was a lot of Melissa adventures, <laughs> so to speak, you know, she was, she was pretty crazy and she was pretty like, for most of the time that I knew her, she was pretty like, uh, um, feel always kind of drunk, crying, feeling sorry for herself. I'm going to walk through some of the alleys because that's where I'm likely to find mud with prints. Um, we are in the Cougar area now. So, yeah, there were a lot of episodes with, with Melissa. And my last experience with her, I got in a fight with her. Um, I was living there. I had Mahoney, my, my young wife, and... Uh, our daughter Justine and 
uh, Melissa was not supposed to be around Justine. <laughs> And uh, we had left Justine to get babysat by my grandma, uh, who was then living there too. You know, you'll hear in my teenage years, several family members from both sides end up following my parents up into Oregon. Melissa was just the first wave, but uh, her mom then moved up and we had our daughter staying with grandma, great grandma, uh, being babysat. And I came to pick her up, and Melissa was there. And she had brought a present for Justine. And then when I showed up, she started making a big deal that Justine never said thank you for the present. And Justine was a super shy, you know, four-year-old girl at the time. Like, even in her teen years, she was so shy, she didn't, like, talk to people much. <laughs> oh, I got a doggy coming up here. Um, doggy with a frisbee. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Melissa was making a big deal out of it. Maybe I, and she started saying, maybe I should take it back. And I was like, fucking take it back. And I don't ever want to fucking see you again, you know. <laughs> like, it just went, like, you shouldn't even been here, you know. Just leave us alone. Um, my, yeah, my last, hey, okay. my last experiences with Melissa were, was bad, hey? Um, anyway, let's see, is there anything else I want to talk about in Boyhood 3 before we do the 12th year synthesis? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm just going to continue walking around a little bit. I'm not going to film it out here, but I'm going to keep looking for those, for some prints now that I'm actually starting to look if I do find any I'll tack them on at the end of the video here but otherwise this will be the conclusion of memoirs boyhood part three